Hello everyone, welcome. Thank you all so much for coming to the Impact of Radio on Our Lives. Our theme this time around is Crime Noir. And there's a little blurb about it in your program that tells you all about what that is, but it's hard-boiled detective stories. And we've had a great 16-week semester, and we're culminating it with this performance for you, our live audience. So thank you for coming, because without you, it's just rehearsal. So we're thrilled to have you here. Right now, let me have everybody take out your cell phones and hold them up in the air. This is your chance to turn off all those cell phones. They can be distracting for our actors. Turn them off. Don't just put them on silent. Actually, turn them off. Sometimes the sound uh, interferes with our sound effects over there. Um, also, if you want to unwrap any hard candies, this would be a great time to do that as well. Thank you. I want to mention that on your seat, you all have a little flyer for another wonderful class that we have on Wednesdays called Self-Awareness Through Improvisation. It's a great, fun, acting, improvisational class. And if you uh, want to come take a free class tomorrow in this very room at 1.30 p.m., uh, come play with us. We're going to have a great time in here, and there will be snacks, and you can get up and play fun improv games with us. We really want to build enrollment for that class for the fall. So um, please do come to that, and then uh, there's on your seat uh, the enrollment information for you. So my name is Sherry Allen, and I'm the instructor for both of those classes. And we have so many wonderful students um, that we'd love to add you to our roster as well. Uh, today we have, on sound effects, Bonnie Smigel and Lee Jackson. Wave. We've got Oric Smith. Uh, special thanks to Oric Smith, who volunteers to come in and do the music for us. And then we have, uh, introducing each one of our shows today, we have Barbara Parker, Pat Knox, Lois Darris, Chuck Knox, and Pat Sullivan. Wave, everybody. <laughs> to our wonderful announcer, Dwight Smart, who was, in fact, a professional radio announcer. So we're very thrilled to have him. And then we have our, the talents of all of our wonderful cast members. Wave when you hear your name. Phil Bellamy, Thomas Brackett, Jerry Carp. Lois Darris, Robert DeLillo, Kat Dufresne, Lisa Ileana, Lee Jackson, Ruth Cadison, Chuck and Pat Knox, Jordan Lawson, Barbara Parker, Anita Provence, Edith Richmond, Harold Sigmund, Dwight Smart, Bonnie Smigel, Pat Sullivan, David Tanner, and Marilyn Wattler. Um, and it's been my pleasure to work with this great group of people here. So the show runs about an hour and a half, no intermission. If you need to use the restroom, please sneak quietly out these side doors. Uh, if you could make sure that they close quietly as you enter and exit, that would be a big help. Um, there is a drinking fountain, and the restrooms are right next door to us. After the show, please enjoy a wonderful uh, buffet of snacks provided by our cast. And uh, we'd love to... Um, have you stay and chat with us and in the meantime please give it up for our first MC for today Barbara Parker the golden age of radio lasted from the 1920s until the late 1950s and even into the early 1960s and every day shortly after sunset America would pull up her chair to a little box and spend a delightful evening as magically fiction was made to come alive First, we feature Rocky Fortune, an American radio drama that aired weekly on NBC Radio beginning in October 1953. This series ended its run March 1954 after 25 episodes. Frank Sinatra portrayed Rocky Fortune, a young man constantly in need of employment who accept, accepts odd jobs. Rocky uses the hep slang of the time and attracts trouble wherever he goes. The characters are Rocky, a good guy down in his luck, who will take just about any job to make a buck. Lulu, a Southern Belle who is in the habit of collecting husbands and then trying to collect on their insurance money. Marvin, husband number one, a thug, a hitman, and a jailbird. <laughs> Perry, husband number two, a fine, upstanding lawyer. Sergeant Finger, Rocky's pal down at the police station. We now present, from 1954, an episode titled, Too Many Husbands, or... The too much married blonde. NBC presents Frank Sinatra's The Footloose and Fancy Free Gentleman, Rocky Fortune. Hi. You know, there's an old saying, never look to get force in the mouth. I now write me a new saying, never look to get blonde in the eyes. 
She was blonde because her hair told me so. She didn't walk, she insinuated. She was from New Orleans, her name was Lou, and believe me, brother, Lou was no lady. When I saw her, I said to myself, I did this babe. She almost dug me too, right into a grave. <laughs> Don't tell me an interesting man like you spends time in an unemployment line. You call the shots, baby. I'm awful easy to get along with. Buy you a cup of coffee? Make mine straight. You got all the sugar I need. Mm. You have something on your mind? Why don't you spill, honey? Oh, well, I love a direct man. You never mind sticking your neck out when there's money involved. Story of my life, baby. I got me a little plan where you make yourself $5,000. All you have to do is one teeny weeny little old thing for teeny weeny little old me. I like you, Gypsy. Just what does little old me have to do for little old you to make the little old five grand? Kill my little old husband. <laughs> There's one thing I got too much of. From where I sit, the distribution's great. I got too many husbands. <laughs> what? I thought you said you got too many husbands. You heard me right, honey. But that's illegal. It's all the law's fault. They weren't supposed to let Marvin out of prison. It's an ex-con you want me to bump? No, it's Perry I got to get rid of. Who's Perry? My husband. Who's Marvin? My husband! So, you have two husbands, Marvin and Perry, both alive and kicking? Well, Marvin's kicking because of Perry, but Perry ain't kicking because he don't know about Marvin. Lady, you just don't seem right to me. <laughs> By the time I reached my pad and opened the door, I decided to forget the busy blonde and find myself another playmate. I reached for the light switch when something hit me. Oh. Oh. That something was a blackjack. The awakening came like a slap in the face. So I had to do this, Mr. Fortune, but it was necessary. Oh, who are you? You stay away from my honey pad. Yo, what? Well, honey pear, you shouldn't be messing around with Lulu Ann. Lulu Ann? Oh, the lights are on. Could you be Marvin? Yeah, I sure am. You belted me on the head? I did, uh, I'm awful sorry. Hey, if you want to wrestle, give me a chance to move in. Careful, Mr. Fortune. This gun is loaded with real bullets. It would hurt me to have to kill you. I wouldn't feel so good about that myself, Marvin. Let's talk. I had to convince you to stay away from my honey pear. I ain't interested in your honey pear. That won't make no difference. She's interested in you. She wants me to do a job for her. She offered me the five grand to bump Perry, husband number two. To bump Perry? Ha <laughs> ha, that's sweet. She knows I'd bump Perry if she asked me to. She just don't want me to get into trouble. That really touches me. I think you're both touched in the head, pal. I want no part of your honey bear, her five grand, or you now scram. Stay away from my honey bear, no matter what. And don't you worry about taking care of Mr. Perry. I'll see he gets taken care of right now. Oh. Oh. The only thing that convinced me the whole bit was for real was the lump on my skull. That much was very real. Next was to make a fast trip to the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Perry Shane. Even the doorbell in the Smike layout looks like solid gold. Yes? Mr. Perry Shane? That's right. I gotta talk to you, Mr. Shane, and fast. I don't understand. You will. Just get out of the doorway and close the door. Wait a minute. I don't like being shoved around in my own home. Who are you? Rocky Fortune's the name, pal. Look, I'll give it to you straight. Somebody's trying to kill you. An ex-con by the name of Marvin's looking for you right now. Why does he want to kill me? Did I send him up? I don't know. I didn't even know you were a mouthpiece. Is your wife at home? No, she hasn't been home all day. Do you know my wife? Your wife is the reason Marvin wants to kill you. Would you mind elaborating? The picture ain't pretty. Your southern belle wants you dead. I don't know what this is about or who you are, but will you please leave before I call the police? Look, mister, she wants you dead. She offered me 5000 to kill you. No one makes accusations like that against my wife. Get out of here! Get out of my house! I hate to belt you, but it's for your own protection, Mr. Shane. Oh! oh. 
I'm getting awful tired of being shoved around. How long have you been married? That's none of your business. This bump on my noggin was none of my business either before I got it. Your wife's husband is the one who gave it to me. My wife's husband? Are you insane? Whether you believe it or not, your wife has another husband. An ex-con by the name of Marvin. You mean her ex-husband? I know she's been married before. Her present husband. He was supposed to be a lifer, so she never bothered with a divorce. But the law let him out. If this is true, and frankly, I don't believe it. What's your interest? Oh, your wife offered me five grand to knock you off. Sounds like a handsome offer. What's stopping you? A couple of things. First, it's illegal. Second, you'd be dead if I did. And those two items are stopping you from earning $5,000? If so, it's because you want even more from me. That flatters me not, pal, but at least you think maybe I'm telling the truth. And you suggest I call the police and tell them I'm about to be killed. And please send me a police escort. Sergeant Fingers, my boy there. I'll call him and we'll both go over on to headquarters. Well, there's the phone. Let's hope Finger is at hand. 20... 25th Precinct. Sergeant Finger, I'm going to put on an attorney by the name of Mr. Shane. He's got an ex-con gunning for him. Wait a minute. Who's gunning for who? I got to get this guy over to your protection, so here's the man. This is Perry Shane. I don't know what this is about, Mr. Shane, but if Rocky says your life is in danger, we'd better get over here right away. Wait a minute, Sergeant. Since I don't know this man, and I don't know you... Perhaps we both better come down to the precinct. It's your life, Mr. Shane. Away we went. Lawyer Shane's car was parked right in front of the plush apartment building. It was long, black, and shiny. We made towards the car past the snooty doorman. Shane opened the door and started to get in, but I saw a car pulling up and shoved him to the ground. Hit the ground! What happened? Take a peek at that hole in your windshield. Now get behind that wheel and let's get out of here. Did you see who it was? Yeah, pull over. It was little old Lou's little old husband Marvin. Who else would take a shot like that? The hole in the windshield was right where I would have been if you hadn't pulled me to safety. Save the drama. I'm going back to your apartment. You go over to the precinct that brings Sergeant Finger back on the double. Now move! Rube Goldberg stuck a bulb over my head and an idea lit up. The next move could be at the plush pad, and I'll be there to see it. No sooner did I get the door open when... Oh, Rocky, I'm so happy. It's little old you. I'll bet. I saw the whole thing outside this window. I was horrified. Why? I thought you wanted him bumped. I do, but I didn't want you bumped. I couldn't stand it if anything happened to you. Lady, you kill me. I had a change of heart. I realized if I still had Marvin as a husband, even with Perry out of the way, that won't do. I got different ideas now. I want me another husband. I got him all picked out. Your little plan was screwball enough to work. Crazy Marvin will do anything you want. He kills Perry for you, you testify you saw him do it, and... And the law kills Marvin. That leaves me minus two husbands. And plus Perry's loot. And plus husband number three, you. Me? Oh, no, thanks. I'd rather be alive. Oh, Rocky, don't be silly. Together we're really going to live. I'm sorry. Uh, the Lululand picked you, Mr. Fortune. You're the sorriest sight I ever saw, and that 38 your packet looks mighty disagreeable. Oh, Marvin, honey, I'm going to give you a nice big kiss. Lululand, I think you better stay over here with Rocky. If I hadn't heard it from your own sweet lips, I'd never believe it. You want me dead. Oh, Marvin, baby. I was only telling that to Rocky just to keep him from calling the police. Now you go right ahead and bump off Rocky while I throw a few things in the bag. Go ahead and shoot me. The cops will be here in a minute. You'll fry and little old Lulu will be left with money bags Perry. Don't you be saying things like that. 
Don't you see, Marvin? She's got to get rid of you so she can be legally married to Perry. She can't get his money while you're still alive. Don't you believe a word he says, Marvin? We'll find a way to get a Perry's money together. You go ahead and kill Mr. Rocky Fortune. All oh, this shouting is confusing. Get ready to go, little man. I'm going to shoot him. Ah! I've been shot. Ouch. I'm so surprised. If he was surprised, think how I felt. I was ready for the hot lead to hit me, and instead the guy with the gun falls. The explanation came from Sergeant Finger. Someday, Rocky, that luck of yours is gonna run out. Why didn't you come to the precinct with Mr. Shane? Didn't you overhear the story as told by Honey Pear and Marvin? The way you were all shouting, we could have heard it all the way down to the precinct. Come on, Honey Pear, we're going downtown. I refuse. You have to talk to my husband. He's my lawyer. Your ex-lawyer, Lulu Ann, and your soon-to-be ex-husband. Annulment proceedings start tomorrow. You can't annul me. Marvin's dead, and he's the only other husband I ever had. Correction. Marvin's hand got blasted. He'll be okay in a week. He can see you both now. In... I can see you both now in your little steel cage overlooking the Hudson. If you're real sweet, I'll get you a, a room with a southern exposure. <laughs> Mr. Shane, Honey Bear wasn't a smart chick. How did she get hooked up with a smart guy like you? I was lonely and she was pretty. Need I say more? I'm a successful attorney, Miss, Mr. Fortune, and a wealthy man. How about I offer you a job? Who, me? Caged up in an office wearing a white collar? Oh, no thanks. Process servers have no use for white collars and they lead a pretty eventful life. Process server, huh? Didn't think of that. Could be interesting and lucrative. I'll have to kick that one around. Well, while you're kicking it around, I'll make out a check for a sizable, sizable advance. I tell you what, Mr. Shane, make it out to my favorite charity. Which is? Cash, Mr. Shane. <laughs> C-A-S-H, cash. <laughs> You've been listening to Rocky Fortune, presented by the NBC Radio Network. Let's have a round of applause for Cat. <laughs> Welcome to another five-minute mystery. See if you can solve the case before the end of the program. Our story takes place in Greens Gap, a small town in the Southern Cavern District. Five Minute Mysteries was a syndicated series available beginning in the late 1940s to radio stations with five minutes to spare. The format invited the listener to solve the mystery during the final commercial and to test their judgment against the detective or cop on the case. From 1940, we now present Five Minute Mysteries, My Pal Patsy, with the following characters. Yours truly, Dr. Melville, a country doctor. The man on the phone. Lynn, a police officer, and Mr. Getty, the bad guy. Green Gap Hospital, Dr. Melville speaking. Doctor, doctor, there's been an accident out at Ingle Cavern. Accident? What kind of accident? Two men was exploring and they got lost last night. One's unconscious. You better come quick before he's dead. Uh, hey, Lynn, I hope you know how to get out to Ingle Cavern. Well, with the job of being town constable, ambulance driver, reckon I know all about this country. Ever been in the cavern, then? One stop in Melville, when I was a boy. Nearly got my hide tanned off by my paw. Ingle Cavern is a mighty treacherous place. You mean it's easy to get lost in it? Not only that, Doc, it's got that, you know, cavern gas, uh, mm, carbon or uh, something or other. You mean carbon dioxide? Yeah, that's it. All of a sudden you're running into something that stuff, and before you know it, bean, you out. Still, people seem to go exploring there. More fools to be. I wouldn't go in them caverns, at least not without a dog. A dog? What for? Well, if you have a dog and it starts collecting the gas, then he'll just keel over. Oh, 
Ah, Mr. Getty, I'm afraid your friend is dead. Poor Patsy. It was from the gas, wasn't it, Doc? That's what it looks like to me. Well, why are you going why are you going to that cavern anyway? Patsy asked me to. He never seen a cave before. How far did you go in? Well, it didn't seem very far, but all of a sudden we lost our way. Where was that? Well, how do I know whereabouts it was? If we was lost, we tried to trace our way back, but it wasn't no use. Patsy started to get scared. It's kind of funny to see a big guy like that get scared. Yes, he is rather big, isn't he? Yes, six foot four. The mob used to call us Mutt and Jeff. And then what happened? Well, I was a little scared myself. But we stuck together. You know, walking in the dark with only my flashlight from the car. All of a sudden, Pat's keeled over. From the gas? Yeah, that's what I figured. His head hit on a rock, and I guess that just about finished him off. I suppose you reckon yourself pretty lucky there, mister. Yeah, sure. I figure it's only because I'm only five foot three that I got out of there alive. The gas must have been just about a foot over my head. I think you better arrest Mr. Getty for the murder of his friend Patsy. We'll return to our story in just a minute, but first, a word from our sponsor. Use Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath what it you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. And use Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. And now see whether you are observant as Len and a doctor. Back to our five-minute mystery. Hey, copper, let me put my hands down. They're tired. When you're in Green Gap's jail and not before. Oh, I don't get it. It was a good story. I still can't figure out how you found out. Well, Lynn tells me that you used to take they used to take the dogs into the cabin because the gas is heavier than air. It collects on the floor. If you really met gas, you're so short, you would have keeled over first before your pal Patsy. Well, what do you know? Nowadays in this mighty racket, I need a college education. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and be sure to see us or join us next time to see if you can solve another five-minute mystery. Uh, Let's have you fun. Uh, 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 this next series lasted a little over a year of the, in the mutual broadcasting system in the 40s and adapted mystery stories penned by famous writers into Half Hour Adventures, Man Against Murder. We now present Murder Clinic, the scrap of lace with the following characters. Madam Story, a beautiful female detective. Bella Brickley, her faithful secretary. Mimi, also known as Mrs. Peter Kruger, a young heiress. Jack Rowcliffe, an irresponsible playboy in love with Louise Mayfield. Suzanne, the French maid. <laughs> Murder Clinic. Stories of the world's greatest detectives. Men Against Murder. Tonight, the famous Madame Rosica story in a scrap of lace. Good evening, Madame Story. Good evening. And what's the tale you're about to tell us, Madam Story? It is called A Scrap of Lace, a story of jealousy and death. The great Kruger family ruled New York society for generations. The beautiful young Mimi Kruger inherited her de deceased mother, mother-in-law's scepter, also the elderly spinster social secretary, Teresa Pigon. Our tale begins one morning in the breakfast room of the Kruger Estates, 
Mimi and Teresa have just finished breakfast. Oh, Teresa, must I go to yet another dull dinner at the Bransoms? Couldn't you please call it off? Sorry. Uh, listen to me, young lady. This dinner is given especially for you. You seem to forget, my dear. As a member of the Kruger family, you have certain duties and responsibilities. Oh, Teresa, you're living in the past. Times have changed since old Mrs. Kruger's day. Life is much more casual these days. Times haven't changed to the point where custom and courtesy no longer matter. Well, that may be, Teresa. But when John gets back from his latest business trip, I'm seriously thinking of asking him if I can replace you with your new assistant, Louise Mayfield. You can't possibly be serious. I most certainly am. She's young like me, and she enjoys having fun. She isn't an old stick in the mud like you. It is of no concern what you think of me. I have served the Kruger family faithfully all my life. You will find it very difficult, if not impossible, to persuade them to get rid of me. But speaking of Louise, she's been acting very odd lately. I think she's trying to avoid that handsome devil, my cousin Jack. Yes, I've noticed his interest in her. Well, I don't blame him for being attracted to her. Louise is very lovely. She is indeed, and she's attracted the interest of more than one gentleman around here. What exactly do you mean? You might have to discuss the matter with your husband, <gasps> Mr. Kruger, when he returns. Oh, here's Louise now. Good morning. Will you be meeting me this morning, Mrs. Kruger? Yes. Please remind Jack of the dinner Teresa insists we go and attend tonight. Oh, must I, Mrs. Kruger? Please do so, my dear. Jack, I only came to remind you of the dinner this evening. Oh, my darling Louise, I want to marry you. Don't be silly, Jack. Why won't you leave me alone? Uh, I'm mad about you, Louise. I'm in love with you and there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. How many times must I tell you, Jack, I'm not interested? Uh, uh, is there another man? Who is it? Who is he? That's none of your business. I'll have you or no one will. Jack, Jack, let go of my wrist. You're hurting me. Well, Jack's still making passes at the servants, I see. Teresa, please. What's going on, Louise? Are you not only after my job, but after Mer Mr. Rowcliffe, too? Teresa, I have no ambitions in either direction, I assure you. Come in. Mademoiselle? Miss Louise? It is Suzanne, the maid. Come in, Suzanne. Mademoiselle? A letter has arrived for you. Oh, what an exquisite handkerchief. Ah, yeah, mademoiselle. You have a secret admirer. No, no Suzanne. <laughs> I'm sure it's from Mrs. Kruger. It certainly is very lovely. Uh, shall I put the scent, uh, <coughs> the perfume on it, uh, mademoiselle? No, thank you. Uh, I will do that myself. But leave my perfume out on the desk, on the table. Oh, oui, mademoiselle. You may go, Suzanne. Thank you. Bonsoir, mademoiselle. Ah. Oh, it smells so lovely. <clears throat> I'll just put one more drop of perfume on this lovely handkerchief and <coughs> 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 Suzanne, help, help, I can't breathe, <laughs> help. Mimi, I've never had to cope with anything so sordid. Dr. Plummer refuses to sign the death certificate. Louise is dead, and he suspects foul play. Maybe he's right. 
Oh, when will Madam Story get here? That may be her now. Thank goodness you're here, Madam Story. This is a terrible situation, a most unfortunate accident. I was under the impression that Louise Mayfield had been murdered. Has Dr. Plummer offered uh, his reasons for refusing to issue a death certificate? He says Louise was instigated in some manner. He's we were in a dinner sure. party miles away from here, and when we got home, we found Louise, Miss Mayfield, dead. The maid insists a lace handkerchief came in the mail for Louise, but it's disappeared. Ah, very interesting. I will start by questioning um, everybody. <laughs> Madam Story consults with her assistant, Bella, for the next morning. Good morning, Bella. Oh, still typing last night's notes? Yes. Do you believe Louise Mayfield was murdered? No doubt about it. How horrible. So young and full of life. And it is our job to find out who killed her. Do you have any ideas? Mm, yes, Bella. I must find that lace handkerchief. I am certain it had something to do with her death. Madam Story investigates the scene outside Miss Mayfield's window. Ah, Madam Story. Mr. Oakliff, uh, standing underneath her window, I see. Uh, yes. Mm, Ivy-clad walls. I, I wonder why the uh, ivy, uh, the vines are torn and uh, broken. Uh, are they? Uh, I hadn't noticed. I understand that you were in love with Miss Mayfield. Yes, I loved her more than anything in life. Why didn't you tell me, Mr. Rockcliffe, that you came back here after last night? Uh, how did you know? Oh, I didn't. You just told me. <laughs> <laughs> what time was it when you got back here? It was 9.30, I think. And you climbed up that ivy up to her window, didn't you? Huh? How did you know that? Uh, the broken ivy. She tells her own story. <laughs> uh, I, I went in and found her lying on dead on the floor. I, I, I suppose you don't believe me. Oh, no, no, no. I, 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 I reserve judgment. Give me the handkerchief you took as the re remembrance of her. It was the last thing she touched. There it is. So... Mr. Rocliffe found the missing handkerchief on Louise Mayfield's body? Yes, Bella. This handkerchief. She was the murder weapon. What are you going to do now? Present the murderer with a noose? Yes, Bella. I will present a handkerchief to each of the subjects, suspects, to guard carefully, as I will be asking for its return in the morning. I have a hunch this will be the means of proving who killed Louise Mayfield. Mrs. Kruger, I have asked you and Ms. De Guillaume, Ms. De Guillaume and Mr. Rockcliffe to meet me here this morning in order that we may determine who killed Louis Mayfield. What do you mean? You know who killed her? You know who killed her? I believe I do, Mrs. Kruger. A lace handkerchief sent to her through the mail was the murder, we murder weapon. Yesterday, I gave each of you a handkerchief and asked that you bring it here with you this morning. I don't understand. What is this? Is it a trick? Yes, right, Mrs. Kruger. It is a trick, but only one a guilty person need to fear. Bella, take the handkerchiefs. May I have the handkerchiefs, please? Here's mine. Here you are. I've been instructed to mark each one with the initials of the person from whom I have taken it. I still don't understand, Madam Story. <laughs> I laugh because none of you had the original handkerchief. That has never left my possession. And here it is, impregnated with a po deadly poison gas, which, when moistened, releases a lethal gas. A young girl would inevitably moisten it with perfume at some point. But surely you don't suspect any of us. And why not? A murderer is often driven by fear. Each of you faced a fear of loss as far as Louise Mayfield was concerned. One of you feared a loss of position, of prestige, of being supplanted by a younger woman and risked murder to protect everything that you had. Bella! One person alone knew what the fatal handkerchief contained. Madam Story gave each of you what you thought was the real handkerchief to see what you would do with it. Examine those handkerchiefs, Bella. Yes, this one has changed since yesterday. 
It's been washed. The initials on it are T D G. <gasps> Teresa de Gillum. You, but why? Keep away from me. Keep away from me. I say I'll shoot. Don't you understand? I spent my whole life in faithful service to this family. I could see what was going to happen. They were going to replace me with somebody younger. Where would I go? What would I do? Oh, God! No! She no! shot her. She shot herself. Oh, oh, poor little Teresa. Oh, I think it was all my fault. I shouldn't have threatened to have Louise take her place. No, 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 no. It was not your fault, Mrs. Kruger, no. Teresa just could not face the inevitable passing of the only world she knew. You've been listening to Murder Clinic. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Richard Diamond, private detective, aired on radio from 1949 to 1953, and on television from 1957 to 1960. Dick Powell starred as Richard Diamond a light-hearted detective who ended episodes singing Leave It to Love to his girlfriend, Helen. Rick's partner on the police force, Lieutenant Walt Levinson, was played by Ed Begley. From 1949, we now present Richard Diamond, private detective, in The Gibson Murder Case, with the following characters. Eddie King, your announcer. Richard Diamond, private eye. Helen Asher, Diamond's high society type girlfriend. <laughs> Lieutenant Walt Levinson, Rick's partner on the police force. Harvey Austin, a scam artist. Virginia Ginny Austin, also known as Miss Pelgrim, Harvey's wife and partner in crime. Leland Gibson, their elderly victim. Miss Gibson, Leland's daughter. Esther Blodgett, a school teacher with a crush on Richard Diamond. <laughs> and Adam's hotel clerk and a tough as nails landlady. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Get ready for another thrilling episode of Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. I'm Richard Diamond, Private Eye. I've seen it all. Well, most of it. But here it was again in the big city. One more crime. Jimmy! Yeah, genius. <laughs> this whole rotten mess is your fault. I don't want to play hostess to a lot of men in blue. I'm allergic to handcuffs. You no, know, she got away with a mink. What do you want me to do? Leave it behind? Look, baby, if Gibson goes to the police, I'll have to hop the coat so we can blow this joint, see? All right, you go get rid of it, and I'll start throwing some things in our suitcase. Okay, okay. Dump the coat. I don't want the landlady to spot it. Yeah, good idea. Gibson, what are you doing here? Who is it, Hob? Hello, Virginia. I, I waited in front of the other apartment and followed you here. I wanted to make sure you sent the police to the right place. Look, why don't you give her a break, Mr. Gibson? Uh, you should have thought of that a few hours ago when you accused me of making love to your wife. Why, you, I oughta... Hob, stop! Take your hands off of me. <coughs> you struck me. I'll shut you up for good. Hobby, Hobby, Hobby! <laughs> you idiot! Huh? Look what you've done. Now what are we gonna do? We gotta get him out of here. Diamond Detective Agency. Murders financed while you wait. <laughs> this is Helen Asher, the girl that goes steady with Diamond Detective Agency. Sounds like a fine organization. Are they reliable? Very seldom. <laughs> The Diamond Detective Agency is going to show you a shortcut to spin the bottle. Uh, how long will it take you to pucker? About two seconds. Don't hold it or you'll end up looking like uh, Betty Boop. 
You're terrible. Yeah, but I'm pretty. You're the most wonderful man in the world. See you at eight. Bye-bye, darling. What a gal. Uh, Diamond Detective Agency? Is, is, is this M Mr. Diamond? Please, you've got to help me. Yeah, take it easy. Who is this? I came home this afternoon, and when I unlocked my door and went in, I saw this corpse sitting on my chair. Who's the dead guy? I don't know. I never saw him before in my life. Why didn't you call the police? I'm a school teacher, Mr. Diamond, and I was afraid of the scandal. Well, give me your name and address, and I'll be right over. Esther Blodgett, 419 East 79th Street. And don't let anyone in. Don't touch anything. I'll be right over. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Grit your teeth. Get over to 79th Street, apartment 108. Mm, homicide? Yeah. Dave Who's named Esther Blodgett lives there. Who's dead? Uh, I don't know. I had to call the cops whether Esther Blodgett wanted the scandal or not. I'm an ex-cop. I follow the rules. I grabbed a cab. Twenty minutes later, I was staying in Esther's apartment with Walt and the dead guy. Walt, what'd you find out? Ah, uh, not much. Connor, Connor will be here in a few minutes. Esther, when you came in, are you sure the door was locked? Yes, it has a catch lock. Did you touch anything? I touched nothing. No, a car sitting in a room with the door and all the windows locked? I've been away for several weeks. Well, he wasn't killed in this apartment. No sign of a struggle. He must have been carried in. You say you never saw this man, Esther? Never in my whole life. Walt, is there any identification in his wallet? Yeah, the name's Gibson, Leland, Leland Gibson. Miss Blodgett, you'll have to come downtown for some questions. Mr. Diamond. Just call me Rick, dear. I'll have you out in no time. <laughs> but, but this has never happened to me before. I left Walt, Esther, and the corpse headed for an old brownstone in the wealthier district. When I rang the doorbell, I got another surprise. Yes, how may I help you? Uh, do you know a Mr. Leland Gibson? Yes. He's my father. I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you, Miss Gibson. Something's happened to father? May I come in? Yes, of course. Now, please, what's happened to father? Uh, your father was uh, murdered. <gasps> oh, no! I knew this would happen! You did? Dad <laughs> left the house three weeks ago and moved you to a hotel. Do you have any idea why? It was a woman! A woman. Mm. Yes, and I never saw her. He never said any more about her. What hotel did he move to? It was the Adams on Madison Avenue. He used to go there for dinner before he decided to move in. It's okay. Ball your head off. It'll do you some good. I felt like a heel leaving Miss Gibson in that condition, but... There was other stuff to do, so I grabbed another cab and headed for the Adams Hotel. Yes, sir. Do you wish to register? No. I want to find out about someone who did three weeks ago, uh, Mr. Leland Gibson. Why, yes. He's staying at the hotel. Well, that's past tense. I don't understand. Well, he's kind of uh, dead. <laughs> when did you last see him? Early this morning. Know he, where he was going? He left the hotel around 10. Do you, Why? Remember, do you remember him having any visitors? No. Uh, like a girl, I mean. Oh, no. Mr. Gibson's daughter thinks he was running around with a woman. Oh. You say that like you knew what I was talking about? It was common gossip. Oh. What's her name? Virginia Pelgrim. Good looking, about five feet, brunette. Very well, uh... I'd like to see her. She left the hotel about a week after Mr. Gibson arrived. Do you know where she moved? Check with the flower shop. Mr. Gibson used to send flowers every day. If Virginia Pelgrim was my best lead, she could tie the Gibson murder up with a silk ribbon. The flower clerk gave me the address. Yeah, what do you want? <laughs> Here's my badge. 
You cops ever polite to anybody? I'm looking for a girl, about five foot three, dark brunette. I'm not her, mister. <laughs> her name's Pilgrim. Oh, her. She lives upstairs. She does, huh? Is she in now? No, went out this morning and hasn't come back. And she probably won't. She have any visitors? Only a couple men. That figures. Ever see an elderly man? Gray hair? About 60? Yeah, sure. Every day. Know his name? <laughs> no. You said she had a couple of visitors. Who else? Well, another man. Young guy. Kind of greasy. Only came around a few times. This old man was there this morning. They had an argument. Could you hear what they said? I don't snoop. <laughs> Who paid her rent? She did. Cash. Mind if I take a look at her apartment? Got a search warrant? Uh, no. Then you can't. You've been charming. <laughs> I left the old bat. <laughs> Headed back to the school teacher's apartment. I'd seen setups like this before, but there was still the problem of finding out how Gibson was killed and how he got into our locked room. Hello, Walt. What's new? Send to the station for a search warrant. Tell him to get over to 12th Street. See what he can find out in a Miss Virginia Pilgrim's apartment. Who's Virginia Pilgrim? The only person who was mixed up with a murdered man. There was another man who used to see her. Can't find out who he was. All right, I'll get the warrant. What What did you find out, Walt? Uh, there were 11 people in the building at the time of the killing. None of them ever saw the guy before. Here's a list of the names. Thanks, Walt. Have you talked to the landlady? She doesn't know any more about that than the rest of them. Oh, I'll get that, Miss Blodgett. Probably the lab. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Okay, thanks. Rick, do you know who did it? I got a hunch. Oh, you're wonderful. Yeah? <laughs> well, your killers are on the second floor, Walt. Uh, how do you figure? Well, look at what we got. A dead body in a locked room, blood on body, and on the floor around the body, nowhere else in the room, Probably carried in. Ah, and a rug. Bullseye. Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> yeah, but how does the dame call Virginia Prelgan figure into this? The dead man met her when she was waitressing in his hotel. He put her up in an apartment so he could see her more often. She was working with another man who was seen by the landlady. What about the motive? My guess, Gibson was blackmailed. He was going to yell cop, so they killed him. And the locked room, explain that. Don't let the landlady explain it. Ask her who had this apartment before, Miss Blodgett. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Austin, they moved to a smaller apartment on the second floor and let me have this one. They're up on the next floor. And what did Mrs. Austin look like, Walt? <laughs> oh, about five foot three, dark brunette, smoking. <laughs> Say no more. Come on, Walt. I want, to, I want to talk to you, Mr. Austin. I told you everything I know. We're coming in. Who is it, Hob? Them cops again. Hello, Virginia. Do I know you? Where's your rug, Mr. Austin? Down in the basement. Uh, Miss Pilgrim, how long have you been married to this man? About three... Hey, how do you know? Know your name? Why? <laughs> Why did you lie about not knowing Mr. Gibson? I, I didn't. I never saw him before in my life. I didn't tell you the dead man's name was Gibson. How'd you know that? Don't answer that. You and your husband killed Mr. Gibson and carted him downstairs in a rug. Why would we do that? You dumped him in Miss Blodgett's apartment because you knew she was out of town and you used to live there and so you still had a key. We got enough to hold both of you. The rug will have blood stains on it. <gasps> Get out of my way. Oh, I didn't kill him. Harvey did. <laughs> you can tell me that all about it at the station. Hey, where are you going? Well, it's 6.30. Got a date. Bye. Hi, Rick. 
You're cute. You sound happy. Dinner looks good. Honey, I'm hungry. Oh, I'll answer it. That was some girl asking for you. Oh, some girl. Uh, does she leave her name? Who is she, Rick? Come here, baby. No, I want to know who she is. I said, come here. <laughs> <laughs> we invite you to be with us again next week when we bring you another exciting episode of Richard Diamond's Private Detective. The Adventures of Sam Spade was a radio series based on the private detective character created by Dashiell Hermit for the Maltese Falcon. It ran on all three networks from 1946 to 1951. The radio series took a more tongue-in-cheek approach to the character than the movie or the novel. And from 1949, we now present Sam Spade, the Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail Caper with the following characters. Sam Spade, Private Detective. Fritz Crockett, a detective with a theatrical flair who wants to team up with Sam. Horace Montague, the pickle, pickle king. <laughs> Mrs. Montague, his wealthy American society maven wife. <clears throat> Charmaine Roger, the sexy girl at the costume party dressed as a Follies Brigere dancer. And yours truly as Renault, the chef at the rest, French restaurant La Parisienne. And now the adventures of Sam Spade, detective. Brought to you by Wildwood Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic contains, contains lanolin and the new Wildwood Liquid Cream Shampoo. Let's listen in at the Sam Spade Detective Agency. Hiya, sweetheart. Have you heard of pulling a rabbit out of a hat? Well, I pulled one out of a pickle. I'm about to hop and hit with the lowdown on Flopsy Mopsy and Cottontail Caper. It all began when I entered my office and discovered a young man sitting in my chair with his feet up on my desk sampling from my bottle. The pose was so familiar for a minute, I thought it was me. Hello, Sam. I'll be with you in a minute. Have Th a seat. Thanks, I will. The one you are sitting on. You see, the detective sits in that seat and the client sits over here. Qualifies me for this seat, then. I'm a detective. I see. Well, the detective in this office is Sam Spade, see? He pays the rent and sits behind that desk. Now on your feet. Uh, you need me. Why? With my talent and your luck, we'd be unbeatable. Besides, <clears throat> uh, I have a job for us. Job? Where? Uh, yesterday I met an old friend who wants us to guard a valuable hunk of jewelry at her party tonight. What's the money? Hundred apiece, plus all the caviar we can eat. Better than I expected. What do you want me to do? It's a costume party. We'll have to wear costumes. It's in the deal. I'll break your leg, and you can go as the man who came to dinner. <laughs> you are about to see the reason we're being paid so much. We're to go as rabbits. You as Flopsy, and me as Mopsy. The deal's off. It's been swell. I'll not go anywhere dressed in that ridiculous outfit. One hundred clams is a lot of dough, Sam. At 8 o'clock that night, I found myself walking up the steps of the man mansion of Mrs. Montague, cleverly disguised as Flopsy. Paw and paw was Fritz Crockett as Mopsy. The headpiece covered everything but my eyes, nose and mouth. When we passed the door, Mrs. Montague cruised over to us. Aren't you both so darling? Yeah. Which one of you is Mr. Spade? Well, I'm Mr. Crockett, Mrs. Montague, uh, Mopsy. Oh. oh, well, Mr. Spade, I've always wanted to meet you. How do you like my costume? I'm the only wood nymph in San Francisco. <laughs> the trees will swoon. Oh, you. Mrs. Montague, perhaps you'd be disposed to outline the job? Well, of course I'm going to pick the woman with the most fascinating costume. The winner will lead a parade wearing a jewel-studded crown. The crown once belonged to Josephine of France. Are we here to guard the crown? That's right, Flopsy. How's that? Well, I don't expect any trouble, but it's so valuable I can't take any chances. My husband picked it up in Iran. He's in pickles, you know. 
Where is the crown now, Mrs. Montague? Well, in the safe in the master bedroom on the second floor. Here's the combination. I'd rather not have the combination until it's time to get the crown. Well, don't be silly, Mr. Spain. Besides the crown, there's only about $60,000 in the safe. Oh, well, if that's all. The safe is behind the Degas original. Now just go and enjoy yourselves until you are needed. Fritz and I decided we would lose ourselves in the crowd and keep our big rabbit ears open until we were needed. I was dipping a, cab a carrot into the punch bowl when a girl made her way over to me. I tagged her as a burlesque queen, but she didn't talk much like one. Hello. Would you like to dance with me? I'd be delighted. Who are you? I'm not supposed to tell. Just call me Flopsy. Uh, you Americans, you have the cutest ideals. Yeah, what do you represent? I am a Follies Belcher dancer, you like? The lady was a beaut. From where I stand, it would be impossible not to like. I am a guest of Mr. Montague. You are a detective, no? I hastily detached myself from Miss Follies Berger. How she knew I was detec a detective puzzled me. I sat down to rest, and I no sooner did than a large green pickle with two bandy legs sticking out of it sat down beside me. <laughs> Want to bite a pickle? Uh, no thanks. Go ahead. It's free. I only eat carrots. Thanks, just the same. I suppose you know who I am. As a matter of fact, I don't. I shouldn't tell you, but I'm lonesome for somebody to talk to. My wife's dancing with another man. Sometimes I think she only likes me for my money. I find that hard to believe. I have millions, you know. I'm Horace Montague, the Pickle King. I've sold more pickles than any living man. Congratulations. You like my costume? Never smelled anything like it. <laughs> when I came to this town, it was just an ordinary new pickle. Sometimes I come as dill, sometimes I come as a gherkin. How jolly. Once I came as a sweet sour mixture. Yeah. I guess all I really have is my money. I get kind of tired of being so rich. Yeah, well, well, Horace, I have to be running along. Thank you for talking to me. I was beginning to feel like an extra in Alice in Wonderland. I headed over toward Fritz and the solace of the punch bowl. Oh, there you are, my little bunnies. You can give me the crown now. I'm ready to announce the winner of the costume contest. We haven't taken it out yet, Mrs. Montague. You haven't? But you just said you were going to get it. I did. Bunnies, did you, did stop playing, playing. Not I, Flapsy. Oh, one of you came to me a couple of minutes ago and said you needed the combination to the safe, so I gave it to you. You said you were going to get the crown. Now, where is it? I don't know, but let's find it. When we arrived in the master bedroom, the worst had happened. The Dagar was off the wall. The safe was open, but the $60,000 wasn't even touched. Oh, the Josephine crown is gone. This is frightful. Oh, what will Horace say? You were supposed to guard it. It's all your fault. Maybe you stole it yourselves. Miss Montague, we did nothing of the kind. I distinctly remember you saying you were going to go get it, so I gave you the combination. I know you did it. Oh, look, there's Horace. Horace, what happened, hubby dear? I was walking down the hall when a rabbit came running out, dragged me into this room, made me take off my pickle. Oh! <laughs> He hit me on the head with something. Then he took off his bunny suit, jumped into my pickle, and ran off. Oh, my head. On the floor was a limp rabbit costume. The party not only had a flopsy and a mopsy, but a thieving cottontail. I bounded down the stairs, out the front door. I saw the Follies Berger dancer come running by and enter a taxi. I jumped into another cab and followed her. She entered a shabby gray apartment house. I followed and knocked on every door until I found hers. Yes? It's me, Flopsy, remember? Why did you follow me? Because you are so beautiful. Can I come in? No. Thanks. I said no. Did you not hear me? How did you know there was a detective under my rabbit suit? Uh, you have no right to come in here. Come on, how? Uh, I think I overhear someone say it. Now, if that is all you want to know, Please, go. Why did you leave the party? Because it bored me. Now, why am I being questioned? 
because somebody <laughs> stole the Josephine crown that belonged to Mrs. Montague. I am glad it is stolen, but I did not steal it. What's your name? Charmaine Roger. And what is yours? Sam Spade. Why are you so happy the crown was stolen? Because it does not belong in the ugly home of a childish woman who thinks only of her social position and her money. Oh, where does it belong? En France, where it was appreciated. I see. How much is it worth? Ah, more than one can say. How would you like it if your Abraham Lincoln desk was being used by some businessman to serve his cocktails? I get the point. But uh, I do not know what happened to the Josephine crown. You do believe me. I did, but only because she left what she left the party in that little costume. Well, she couldn't have had it on her. I sat in a cab until I saw her come out in street clothes, carrying an overnight case. I followed her to a restaurant called La Parisienne and went inside. A tall, lean, black-haired individual approached me with a menu in his hand. Good evening, monsieur. I regret to say we have just closed it. Where's that girl that just came in? Girl? No girl in here. You have made some mistake. As you can see, there is no one but here. She walked right in here, 30 seconds ago. Brown hair, red coat, Charmaine Roger by name. I've made no mistake. Now come clean. Monsieur, please let me go. No girl came in. There is no place to hide but the kitchen. All right, then show me the kitchen. Monsieur Renault? Oh, my spade. Didn't take your, you long to get here, Mr. Montague. Don't move, Monsieur Spade. I have a knife at your neck. Shall I take care of him, Monsieur Montague? No, Renault. Put down your knife. Thanks. Mr. Spade and I will sit down at the table and talk quietly. You can go. As you say, Monsieur. But I will keep out an eye. That's an eye out. Spade, I have a personal matter to take up with you about the Josephine crown. In other words, you want me to stop looking for it. That's the idea. I'll pay you a good fee if you do this for me. Um, why don't you want to found, Mr. Montague? A French girl showed up in town, young and beautiful, and I was indiscreet. I saw quite a bit of her at the party tonight. Blackmail? She didn't want money. She wanted the Josephine crown. So you let someone steal it. Why didn't you just give them the crown? I couldn't. It's my wife's prized possession. She even wears it around the house. <laughs> now, will you just forget about this? I'm afraid not. Your wife asked me to guard it. I did a bad job. It's up to me to get it back. Please, Spade. I can't afford a scandal with that girl. You'll have to work that out for yourself. Very well. I'm sorry, but I'll have to keep your mouth shut, Spade. At that point, he produced a gun out of thin air and very professionally released it, me of mine. Just then, the front door burst open and in swept a tall character in black beret and cap, sporting a handlebar mustache. Ah, allons avant de la patrie, le jour de gloire. Ah, what a joyous, charming gathering have we here. Is it not my true ami, Monsieur Montagu? I kiss you on both cheeks. Mwah, mwah. Hey, who are you? You are so soon forgetting me. We met at the Folie Bergère. Do you not recall the nights in Montmartre and the days on Mont Blanc? When he bent over to kiss Montague again, his mustache fell off. As usual, as usual, Crockett had overplayed. Renault hit him on the back of the head, and he fell flat on his face, out cold. That was my cue to go into action. I turned over the table and got to the gun first. At that point, Chris Crockett came too. Ah, uh, mes amis, where did the sudden darkness come from? I, uh... You can drop the, ax the dialect, Crockett. Wish I had a picture of you there on the floor. It was all on the act, Sam. Do you think you're well enough to hold this gun while I make a search? Leave it to me, Sam. Everything's under control. I found the Josephine crown and we called the police. Mr. Montague was forgiven by his wife and returned the Josephine crown to the French Historical Society. Fritz got the crown back to the La Belle France, and I hope he stays there. I don't let, don't let's talk any more of him. The first person to mention his name again is a rotten egg. Good night, sweetheart.
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We now present a caper of catastrophic consequences involving copper coppers and a villain named Paul. And this 1968 bit of wordplay whimsy, originally played with deadpan brilliance by Johnny Carson and Jack Webb as Sergeant Joe Friday, get to the bottom of the Claude Cooper Copper Caper. Clapper Caper. Two <laughs> kids, you don't have to have profanity to be funny. Alliteration will do the trick. A detective questions a rubbery issue. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. Some people rob for pleasure. Some because it's there. You never know. My name's Friday. I'm a cop. I was working the day watch on a robbery when I got a call from the Acme School Bell Company. There's been a robbery. There's been a robbery. Yes, sir. What was it? My clappers. Your clappers. Yeah, you know those things inside a bell that make them clang? The clangers. That's right. We call them clappers in the business. A clapper caper. What's that? Nothing, sir. Now, can I have the facts? What kind of clappers were stolen on this caper? They were copper clappers. And where were they kept? In the closet. Uh -huh. You have any idea who might have taken the copper clappers from the closet? Well, just one. I fired a man. He swore he'd get even. What was his name? Claude Cooper. <laughs> you think he... That's right. I think Claude Cooper, copped by copper clappers, kept in the closet. You know where this cop Claude Cooper is from? Yeah, Cleveland. <laughs> That figures. What makes it worse, they were clean. Clean copper clappers? That's right. Why do you think Cleveland's Claude Cooper would cop your clean copper clappers kept in your closet? Only one reason. What's that? He's a kleptomaniac. <laughs> Who first discovered the copper clappers were caught? My cleaning lady, Clara Clifford. <laughs> That figures. Now let me see if I got the facts straight here. Cleaning woman Claire Clifford discovered your clean copper clappers, kept in a closet, were caught by Claude Cooper, the kleptomaniac from Cleveland. Now is that about it? One other thing. What's that? If I ever catch kleptomaniac Claude Cooper from Cleveland who copped my clean copper clappers, I kept in the closet. Yes. I'll clobber him. <laughs> to attend. Uh, let's have another big round of applause for our fabulous July 24th. It's free right here in this building on Thursdays from 9 to 12 and 1 to 340. It's acrylic painting. We'd love to have you come and join us. So if you'd like a flyer, I have more information about it. And that's over this summer. Please enjoy uh, some refreshments with us now. Thanks again for coming and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming. Bye.